you were born in 1938 in Malaya before Malaysia was even formed. What were your earliest memories from that point in time? Earliest memory would be air raids, siren, and bombs falling in Kuala Lumpur. We had shelters prepared. So I remember going up, taken by my parents into this underground shelter, and there was this air raid sirens and searchlights and bombs going off. I don't know why I have that V collection, but nothing left other than that. And then, as I understand it, my father managed to get us out at the last minute from Malaya, from Singapore, just before the Japanese invaded Kuala Lumpur and got in. That was quite important, right? Because your father was Tun H.S. Lee and he had a bounty that was placed on his head by the Japanese. Yes, that's why. But I think, I don't know why he left it so late to leave. But certainly, I think that if we had not left, we'd all be killed. I think the Japanese were after my father, for sure. Because, you know, you may not know that there was a lot of money raised against the Japanese in the war by the Chinese. And my father is one of those people who helped to raise a lot of anti-Japanese money to fight them. And definitely, even his name is mentioned by Japanese historians as somebody who worked against them. You were so young at the time, but you were living in the middle of a literal war. A sirens had to flee. Did you feel any sense of fear and anxiety at the time? Or it was just something that was happening to you? No, I, I was just too young, absolutely too young. And I think that, I mean, it's sad to say, most of the worries went to my parents, not by us, you know. I mean, I can imagine I was told, you know, for my mother to look after nine children running away with bombs falling and all that was, I mean, quite something for her you know, and my parents. And even when we ended up in, in India, there were quite a few other Chinese families from Malaya and from Singapore. But my father was very lucky in that he knew the British bankers, Santa Charter Bank and HSBC. And so he man managed to get some line of credit from them in India. So that's how we survived, I think. And what was it like being in India? I think you were at Mussoorie and then you moved to Dharadun, then Mumbai. Yes, remember Mussoorie, which was a hill station, cool weather, rather a bit like our Cameron Highlands. And I remember there was a time when my father used to ride horses and he had a bad fall. And I remember seeing him in hospital after the fall. I remember that. Dehradun was beneath Missouri. I still remember we lived in some sort of guava plantation and there was a lot of elephants. <laughs> elephants, you know, in, Among uh, the guava. in that area. Yeah, 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 yeah. But then I was a bit older when we got to Mumbai, those days called Bombay. We went to school there, and I remember we had actually quite a good time. I had a very loving Indian ama to look after us. Went to school, and my parents spared us all the worries of financial, the war, and all that. You know? And of course, during the time, I think from what I see now, my father was constantly involved in what was going on in Malaya and working to come back. And I think there was correspondence with Tan Ching Lok and Tan Siu Sin as to what the Chinese would do in Malaya, even during the war, you know, and uh, they were already planning that. You must have had quite a lot of visitors from Malaya just, you know, coming to see your family as well when you were in India. Yes, we were very lucky. Went to a good school there and lived in a good area. And my parents, the friends, they used to play mahjong bridge and stuff like that. No? But the time passed very quickly. In 1946, we came back and that was a time also which should have been very interesting because it was uh, a bit of chaos in the country. And I still remember we arrived in Singapore and my father had arranged a whole convoy of vehicles to take us back to Kuala Lumpur. The trip lasted the whole day from early morning to night. The car used to break down. You had to fill up the water and the car got overheated and stuff like that. But we managed to get to KL and then I went to school in Batu Road School as a, and then PI. But I think that we had just a few, one or two years life with my father where he was a bit freer. But after that, he was so busy, we hardly saw him. You know, he would go to office. We would go to school. And we would come back in the afternoon to the house. Never saw my father because quite often he'd come back for dinner. My mother, it was explained to me later, she had such a busy and worrying time in India that when she got back to Malaya, I think she was, you know, relieved and tried to enjoy herself a bit. No? She loved playing mahjong, right? So whenever my father never came home for dinner, she also stayed back with her friends playing mahjong. 
So basically, you know, life was between myself and my younger brother, very sheltered. We didn't go out much because of kidnappings and stuff like that going on. In fact, to show you how bad it was, we lived near the Royal Slango Golf Club. Now it's called it the Golf Club. At that time, all around the golf club were rubber estates. Now, this would only be something like two miles or three miles from my house. And some terrorists were killed <laughs> just there. So that's how close they were, actually, you know. And sometimes I think that we are actually very lucky to survive because my father never believed in bodyguards or things like that. Wow. Yeah. So the house, we only had one elderly Sikh Jaga. For some reason or other, nobody bothered us. But I always worried that people would come into the house, etc., etc. Because it was quite a tricky time, you know. Yeah, there was around the time when the British imposed emergency rule as well, right? Because of the communist injustice. As well, yeah. yeah. So then we then left for England in 1951 and, all, and that's it. I mean, uh, we miss all the excitement which my father went through after that. When my father said to my brother and I, look, I'm sending you to school in England. We were absolutely you know, shocked <laughs> and afraid because we are a very traditional Chinese family. We still ate with chopsticks. Right, at the time and uh, we never had a fork and phone so for us to suddenly be transported to a british environment was a real shock for us you know and i still remember going to school you know we were quite small size of course and the big british boys you know standing over us you know it we were very lucky but that both my brother and i were not bullied at school for some reason they didn't pick on us but there was quite a bit of bullying going on because in the 19 51 or 52, some of the English boys who joined school were over age because of the war, you know? So they were actually much bigger than us and all that. When your father first said he was going to send you to UK, you said you were shocked. I wonder why that was the case because you had elder siblings, right? And they also went to the UK. Your sisters went to Australia. Yes, yes. But they were a bit older. They were a bit older when they... My two, two oldest brothers went to England. My two sisters went to Australia. Do you think you were um, sent so early because of the situation back at home and it was just for your safety? Yes, I think so. I think so. And the two elder ones went to study mining engineering and my two other sisters, one did dentistry, the other one became a doctor. Yes, yes, could be that because of the, the uncertain situation, the security and all that, he sent us off early. Back then, you know, you were 14 years old. It was 1952. It's not like you can board a plane and within 14 hours, you're in London. So what was that yeah. journey for you to get from Malaya to the UK? Well, the first trip went by boat and, and it took us three weeks to get to England. We still went through the Suez Canal. Actually, it was quite interesting. You should make a trip. You know, to be the Suez Canal, you know, which is seeing the desert and the Arabs and all that. It was quite, quite interesting. But we were on a boat, which was a Dutch boat. And uh, there were a lot of Dutch people on the boat. I didn't realize it at the time. I was too young. But now, of course, I realized that the Dutch were actually leaving Indonesia. You know, Indian, Indonesia was given the independence. They are all leaving. So that was the reason why there were a lot of Dutch people on the boat. Was it just you and your brother, who I think is younger than you by a year, right? So 14 and... No, uh, my parents went with us on that boat trip. That was the first time. But after that, they just left us in the school. <laughs> and that's it. So you talked about lay school in Cambridge. Do you remember what it was like, you know, just arriving there for the first time, knowing that you were going to spend quite a few years at this completely foreign place? I remember that the first two, three weeks, I was very homesick. But after that, I got over it. But I never did enjoy school. It was too much discipline and the school bell rings, you go somewhere, school bell rings, you go somewhere. No privacy also. And I didn't enjoy it because the, the funny thing about the English is that at school, they will always call you by your surname. They will all call me Lee, never call me Tommy. And that always seemed a bit unfriendly to me when somebody called you by that. But the strange thing with this, same English boys, when I met them in university, they would call me Tommy. I don't know why. Public schools have a culture. They all call smaller boys by the surname. They don't call you by the name. Were there many people from Malaya? Or was it just your brother and you? Not at the school. At the school, there were only three Malayan boys at the time. They were older than me. But, you know, we were different houses. 
the school had different houses and you lived in your house, you know. And we never met each other and really talked because the culture, again, big boys don't talk to smaller boys. And it was like that. But I did meet them when we got to Cambridge University. There was already a Malaya Singapore Students' Union at that time. Then I met a lot of Malaysians and Singaporeans. When you were in the UK, was it hard to stay in touch with your family back home in Malaya? Yeah. Well, we don't have emails and WhatsApp. And my father was so busy, right? We would get a letter from him once a month. And my mother, who didn't write English, you know, she didn't write at all. I mean, the other thing is, of course, the way we left for England, we had no Chinese education, so we couldn't write Chinese. My mother only wrote Chinese, so we could not communicate. I mean, there was no communication, which is another thing. I imagine that must have left an impact on you since you had left at a, such a young age and you were there for nine years, color from your family, from anyone who looked like you. Looking back, how do you think it impacted you as a person? Thinking back, it must have an impact on me, right? Because I really had no parental guidance. But one thing did happen was that my father managed to arrange a holiday home for us so that when we had school holidays, we went down to this person in a town called Seaford in Sussex. And she turned out to be like a foster mother you know, to us. She's a very nice Austrian lady. And we got to know her very well. And she was a person that we could talk to. She was like my mother instead of my mother, you know. So you mentioned that you later went to Cambridge. And Lay School is actually located in Cambridge. So I imagine it must have been quite a strategic choice by your father to pick a school located in a place where he wanted you to go to university eventually. Yes, I think he chose the Lee School because of that, because he always wanted my brother and I to go to his college, which was St. John's College. At that time, I think the university still allowed children of alumni to get into the college. It was not that difficult. So long as you pass your exams and so on, you were preferred because you were a son of somebody. I think he did that. And of course, being at a school inside a university town, we got to know the town very well, even from school days, right? At what point did your father have that conversation with you saying that I want you to do law at St. John's Cambridge? Do you remember that conversation? I think from the very beginning, when I went to school, he already told me to do law. Those days were not like people who nowadays, young people are so much cleverer and know what's going on. We didn't. You know, actually those days, if you had some money, you either become a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, right, or accountant. That was not much choice. So I think my father thought that law was something which, if you didn't like to practice law, there are many other things you could do with law. He thought that it would be good for me to do it. And because I was quite good at English and so on, I really didn't know what to do. He just guided me. So what was it like studying law at Cambridge? It was absolutely no, no technology, but it was a bit of an eye-opener for me, the university, because we tend to be Asians very obedient to the teacher. I found that the English boys are very independent of the teacher. You see, Cambridge is, at that time, I don't always the same. We had the university lectures that you go to, and then you have your tutorials in the college by somebody else. I used to find some very bright English students not even bothering to go to lectures in the university. There was no roll call or attendance. Eh? So you can actually find a whole year without attending lectures. And they just go by tutorials. And they were bright enough. Because one thing I did realize with the English is that some of the English students, especially those who had fathers or mothers who were lawyers, tend to have an aptitude for law. And they could understand the logic or the thinking of law you know, much better than I could. So you also mentioned that you were very sporty while you were in Cambridge. You were doing badminton. I think you were also doing tennis as well, weren't you? Yes, I played both badminton and tennis. I managed to play a lot of badminton when I was in the university. And of course, the team was composed mostly by Malaysians. We had a very good team, actually. I was, I was captain of my college in tennis. I was in a university badminton team for three, four years. And that was very good because I think that for any young person, I've always advised the best way of getting to know people is play sport. When you play sport, you get to know people. So while you were at Cambridge, you were also during the summer working as well. And you were a tourist guide at Costa Brava, Spain. How did that happen? What was it like? Well, this is what I mean by one of the good things was I learned to be independent. 
I don't imagine somebody in my situation doing that, but we were left alone. You know, some friend said to me, I've got a job as a guide in Costa Brava. Why don't you come with me and let's see whether you can get a job there. So I followed him and managed to get a job as a guide, basically because you know, I could speak English and I was guiding English tourists and some German tourists as well who came to Costa Brava. I had to learn some sort of Spanish to do my job, but it was interesting to do that. And then another holiday, I was uh, working in Cambridge in a brewery. And that was another experience working in a brewery because, you know, I was working with the labourer class in England. And actually, I found that they were very nice people to work with. They actually helped me to carry stuff and all that, you know, because I was small. So they were carried for me. And you, know? you can understand that as a working class, which thinks differently because they would look at us as students the elite in Cambridge, whereas they are the working class. But it was a good experience. And during that time, you were also going to London as well to have your bar dinners. Right? Yes, I shortcut everything by eating my dinners. You know, you had to eat, din- I think, what, 12 dinners before you could qualify. So I was already eating dinners when I was at Cambridge. So that by the time I went down to the bar to study for my bar exams, I'd already done most of my dinners. I think that time they were given an allowance as a graduate. I think when I was in London, I think I was only there for nine months or one year. Took my exams and passed. Then I I did a pupillage. And I think that is a very valuable thing which I would advise anyone. I don't know whether it's easy for anybody to get a pupil master nowadays, but I was lucky to get one. And I think that's what I learned most by following the, my master around the courts and working with him in chambers, see what he does, how he prepares for a case and stuff like that. So you were at two Crown Office role in the 1950s, 60s. What was yeah. your life like if you were for someone well, who's never done it? They were actually very, very kind to me, quite honestly. The head of chambers was a man called John Hobson, a very formidable looking chap. He became the attorney general of, of the country. And another person called Jeffrey Lane was a QC, and he became chief justice of the country. They were all very nice to me, I must say. My master was a chap called Charles McCulloch. He is a Cambridge graduate. I still remember this. He always took me out for lunches and insisted on paying for the lunch. I think my father paid something like 50 pounds for the pupillage, but I got it all back from the lunches, (laughs) all the lunches he bought me. What do you feel were the biggest learnings that you had from just shadowing and working with these amazing people? The thing which you will learn is, first of all, integrity. Now, the way these chaps practice, they shared a room and they could actually be opposing each other in a court case. Now, it's unheard of, right? You can share a room and be, you know, your papers and so on and so on. And nobody believes that you can be complicit with each other and doing things, right? But the bar has got that integrity that nobody would even question the system. I I remember, for example, Jeffrey Lane had a court case against my master. So, you know, it's same chambers and nobody thought of anything about that, you know. The bar, we used to follow them and sometimes we listened to some of the top barristers conduct the cases. I still remember a leading barrister at the time was called Gerald Gardiner, who became Lord Chancellor. You know, just to listen to him, the style, the command of English, it was very educational. And it was not as though they had a lot of time to prepare as well, right? They would often get cases on the day where they have to submit. Yes, sometimes you get a court case given to you on the day itself. (laughs) So you just have a quick meeting with a solicitor uh, and then you meet your client and and that's it. And that's the reason why they can do that is because they're specialists. Like, for example, my master was a common law barrister, which means a lot of contract taught negligence. He would know all the leading cases by heart. He didn't need to take any books with him. But I think the mastery is on the facts. Because when you meet the client and you see the case, you listen to the fact, then you have to apply the law. But you still have to analyze the facts. If you don't analyze the facts, the law is useless to you. But they don't need a lot of books because they know the law. So it's just a matter of applying the facts to the law or the law to the facts. You have to really understand and be able to take in a lot of information, right? Wasn't that the story of how one of them had a motor accident and he didn't know anything about motors before then? Yeah, that's another thing. You see, they had such good minds that they could master the facts of any subject of a case. For example, if it's a medical negligence case, 
and they would learn all about the medicine and what happened and so on and so on. But that one that I talked about was in a motor accident where Gerald Gardner was the barrister involved and he was explaining to the judge how a motor car works, how the engine works and how the brakes work. And I, and I was just listening to them and I managed to ask his clerk, I said, Mr. Gardner must be an expert on motor cars. He said, no, no, he, he only just learned about it on this case. <laughs> so you must learn and then articulate the facts. And that's where they're very good. Of course, English being the native language, they should be good at it. But it's the mastery of being able to absorb the information and articulate it. I always tell young people here, don't be shy because you're young. You should grow up quickly. Because I noticed with the English, at age of 25, 26, they are full of confidence. They can go to a board meeting, address directors with full confidence. They have developed that through, I suppose, a childhood, you know. One thing I noticed when my brother and I flew back from England for holiday, the plane was full of English boys and girls in the plane. And they were so badly behaved on the plane. They had pillow fights and all that on the plane. And the air hostess couldn't even control them. But the funny thing is these chaps are like that when they're young. They become more independent quickly. So when they are very young, they can be very independent. That's why I was telling you when the student days at Cambridge, I can actually hear a student say to the lecturer, you tell me this, but this is not what Dicey says. Dicey in his book says something else. So <laughs> actually tell the lecturer that. So, I mean, they, they become much more independent the way, because you might say they're very naughty as a child, huh? but that's the way the things are. So I think maybe sometimes our children are so well behaved, it's not necessarily a good thing. <laughs> so while you were at Two Crown Office Row, did you always know that eventually you would be going home? Did you never have the intention of maybe I want to actually stay on and practice a bit? I think sometimes you realize in life, things just happen. I have never planned anything. As I told you, I didn't know anything about what's going on in this country. So when I was finishing my studies in England, I knew I had to join a law firm in Kuala Lumpur. I knew I had to do chambers in, in a law firm. And my father just arranged everything for me. And I still remember my father said, you know, I'm thinking of two law firms for you. One is Bannon Bailey and one is Churn Delamore. Both of them are uh, quite interested to have you, but maybe uh, you should join Bannon Bailey because I know John Screen quite well. And so that's how it happened. And John Screen came to London on holiday and arranged to meet me in London. We had a chat about it. And, and then he wrote me a letter and said, yes, we will accept you as a pupil. When I got back home, I was totally ignorant of the law. I had not been taught any Malaysian law at all. So it's a real shock to me, but I was so lucky that my fellow pupil was a very bright student called Chan Sek Kyung, who was from Ipoh, and he was chambering. And he had graduated from Singapore with, you know, he was top mark from there. And he was so bright, he used to do work for Malau from Digest. So he knew, he knew a lot about the law. He was very helpful to me. He really taught me a lot. But as you know, he became Attorney General and Chief Justice of Singapore. I think you wanted to do an MBA at Harvard. How did that come about? Well, it was just a fancy, you know, because people thought that, you know, if you do an MBA in Harvard, combined with law would be good. And I think it, it would have been good. But my father, maybe running out of money to finance me, said, no, you come home. I'm not going to pay any more for your studies. So you returned in 1961. Do you feel that you were resentful having to be home? Because you had been gone for so long, you were essentially English by then. Yes, and funny thing is, it took me some time to get used to speaking Cantonese again. But it's strange because I didn't speak it for so long. But the partners at Bannon Bailey were very kind to me. And one of the good things for me was having been educated in England. I got on well with the English people, you know. I think Tommy Thomas, in his latest book, talks about his days in Screen and Company. He talks about how good the partners were. And I can echo his words. I mean, John Screen was a wonderful man. He served the Bar Council for many, many years, but he never took on the chairmanship because he said, this is for, for local people. I shouldn't do it. But he served a lot. Peter Mooney was another person who served a lot on the Bar Council. Stanley Petty, very good barrister and solicitor. 
But the, the main thing about them was that they actually wanted to Malaysianize the firm. They were not holding on to things. They, they knew that they had to go retire and they just wanted to bring in local people. So actually, my brother and I you know, were brought into the firm quite early. When the firm of Bannon Bailey broke up and the new firm of Screen and Company was formed. I think it was only about two, three years later, I was, I was made a partner of Screen and Company. So they were really very good at promoting local people. You must have also been quite inspired by their work ethic as well. I believe John Screen, his wife would say, you're married to the firm. Yes, yes. His wife always used to complain to me that, you know, John Screen spends more time in the firm than with his family. Because even after he retired, he, he was still constantly in touch with, you know, with us and worrying about what, what's happening and so on. Yeah. 